The beliefs of secular humanism are widespread in America today, estimated to be the moral conviction of about 11% of the population. Most do not claim to be secular humanists and do not belong to a secular humanist organization, yet they hold to the basic beliefs of the secular humanist worldview. In his essay, Religious Freedom and the Challenge of Modern Pluralism, sociologist James Davison Hunter notes that most scholars recognize the secular character of public life and the fact that there is a growing constituency who favor these circumstances. One could argue quite plausibly that secular humanism has become the dominant moral ideology of American public culture and now plays much the same role as the pan-Protestant ideology played in the 19th century. This is um, really at the heart of the ideology that created what uh, I have called the naked public square, a public square that is completely devoid of any um, uh, religious referent or of any moral reference that is grounded in religion. We have a public discourse having to do with politics and the moral life of people without any reference to God. Somehow or other God has been taken away uh, from uh, just ordinary common discussion of our country's problems. As secular humanism has gradually gained influence over American culture, its champions have almost unanimously described themselves as promoters of a new religion, a religion more highly evolved than, as John Dunphy called it, the rotting corpse of Christianity. Well, we hope that got your attention. You see, it's time for all of us to face up to the fact that humanists really do control America. According to my friend, Dr. James Dobson, the secular humanistic system of values has now become the predominant way of thinking in most of the power centers of society. Our purpose in this session is to rouse and awaken Christians and pro-moral Americans from slumber toward action. The truth is, this great nation of ours is being ruled by a small but very influential group of committed humanists. Under the guise of democracy, these politicians and academics are determined to turn America into an amoral, humanist country that will fit right in with a one-world government. Here's the breakdown. The federal government consists of 537 elected officials, 435 representatives, 100 senators, a president, and a vice president. Now, not all of those 537 are humanists. But as a whole, they've supported humanistic goals so often that we're truly on the verge of moral collapse in our country. Just check out the website of the Democratic Socialists of America. You'll find that 55 members of Congress are currently listed on the DSA site, some of whom are leading voices in the Democratic Party. Morality is a very low priority with many of these public officials. Take, for example, one current issue on the political landscape. If humanists, along with their powerful homosexualist friends, succeed in forcing the pro-moral majority to accept homosexuality as normal behavior, 2,000 years of Western culture and more than 300 years of American history will go up in smoke. Every American must realize that something is amiss when Boy Scout troops are expelled from public schools and the homosexual agenda is promoted. And you can rest assured that once homosexuals win their case, the legalizing of prostitution, pedophilia, drugs, gambling, and who knows what else is soon to follow. In addition to finding influential humanists in government, we can also find them in a myriad of active organizations and many societies. Recognize any of these names Americans for Democratic Action, National Council of Churches, International League of Working Women, the American Ethical Union. The Sex Information and Educational Council of the United States, the National Organization of Women, the National Education Association, and of course the American Civil Liberties Union. It's also important to note that humanist leaders founded and continue to direct 
the United Nations, UNESCO, UNICEF, and the World Health Organization. Certainly the most effective humanist organization for destroying the laws, morals, and traditional rights of Americans is the aforementioned ACLU, founded in 1919 by socialists and members of the Communist Party. Their activities include, but are not limited to, legal defense for those who supported Fidel Castro, tenacious opposition to voluntary prayer and Bible reading in the public schools, efforts to delete the words under God from the Pledge of Allegiance, and tireless opposition to laws forbidding pornography, abortion, homosexuality, and even pedophilia. You can thank the ACLU for changing Easter to spring break, Christmas to winter vacation, and deeming Christmas programs that feature Santa, Rudolph, and Scrooge to be perfectly acceptable while the celebration of Christ's birth is absolutely out. Now, if all of this isn't enough to cause great concern, consider two more powerful vehicles, the media and the arts. Whether it's talk shows or movies, newspapers or newscasts, these arenas have a definite slant toward leftist and statist views and against Judeo-Christian conservative values. One doesn't have to look long or hard to see this distinct bias. It's dominant and relentless. So even though the situation may look grim, all is not lost. If pro-moral, Bible-believing citizens become as active and vocal as their humanistic counterparts have been, we have the same resources and tools available to us that secularists have been using against us to advance their cause for the last 100 years. Let's take a brief look at how we could begin to turn back the negative effects of this humanistic faith in our schools and reclaim the classroom for our children. Students who accept this faith are thrust into selfishness, godlessness, and moral relativism. Why must students constantly be on their guard against this assault on values? Surely the most basic role of the state, promoting justice, requires the state to treat citizens fairly, rather than forcing one religion on every citizen. Every thinking individual, consciously or unconsciously, adheres to a worldview. Worldviews form the foundation from which we interpret and understand the world. Every worldview proposes values that motivate the adherent. Thus, teachers cannot completely separate their values from the content of their teaching. Value-neutral education is a myth. How can we as Christians and citizens reclaim this ground? When we recognize this value-neutral hoax, we should simultaneously realize the basic unfairness of a policy that bans only those religions with explicitly absolute values from the classroom. Instead of discriminating against Christianity and other traditional religions, the government should open the doors and allow knowledgeable proponents of both theistic and atheistic worldviews in the public schools, in the courts, and in the various government agencies. Such a policy, though imperfect at least, allows the U.S. government to establish an even-handed approach with regards to religions. If Carl Sagan's series, Cosmos, is shown in public schools, then creationist Dr. A. E. Wilder Smith's origins must be allowed. If ethical relativism is taught, then ethical absolutes must be addressed as well. We can't have a monopoly philosophy in the public schools anymore. What can the theistic Sunday schools, meeting for an hour once a week and teaching only a fraction of the children, do to stem the tide of a five-day program of humanistic teaching? I believe that we must do everything we can to equip our teenagers, our children, to know, live, and defend God's truth. A new policy of fairness and even-handedness with regards to religion is not implausible. If a sufficient number of dedicated Christians, ministers, and other pro-moral Americans use their influence, energy, and resources, we can return the humanists to private life and replace them with those who truly represent our nation and its best interests.
In point of fact, they only represent, at the most, 6% of the American public. In our sixth and final session, we're going to share specific, practical, and powerful suggestions for accomplishing this task. Don't miss it. It could change your city, your state, and hopefully your nation. We'll see you next time.